Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. And so we're in this series called Go. And I talked about last week how this next season for Simple Church, I believe, is going to be the most important season that we've ever been in in our entire existence. And I think, I think the same is true for church in general and certainly in the American church. There is a tide that is shifting. There is a, a wind that is coming that says that the old way hasn't worked We've got to change the narrative of God in this world. We've got to literally go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Church has kind of lost its voice a little bit. Now, now be very clear, the gates of hell will not prevail against Jesus' church. Let's, let's make that really clear. But we've lost our voice a little bit. We, we've done a disservice to God's name in this world, if I can just be real honest with you. And we've talked a lot about that. And so last week we talked about the Great Commission. I want to read that again here, Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus, at the end of his, well, not his life, his, I guess his second life, as he's about to be resurrected, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We're called to go over and over again. Jesus says, go. And so last week, we talked about why. Why do we go? Well, because Jesus, the whole reason that we sit in church today, said to. And like we talked about last week, that's good enough when he does it. Because I said so. That's good enough. It's Jesus. And we talked about where do we go? Well, we go to our local area, into our homes, into our families. We go into our cities. We go into our nation and to the ends of the earth around the world. We have a group that went to Mexico that we celebrated. We have uh, our 56 who did missions internally. And we have a group that just got back from Africa that put on a deaf camp uh, over there. And we, I can't wait to hear about the stories of what happened there. But we are taking the word to the nations. That's what we're called to do, to go. And so over the next few weeks, we said we're going to answer the who, what, when, where, why, and how of taking the gospel, the good news of Jesus, into this world. That's our goal. And so today, we're going to answer the who. Now, there's probably, in your mind, a pretty easy answer to that. And there is. If I said, who should we take the gospel to, you would say, Everyone. okay, that was about 20% participation. Come on, rain people. Get with me. We already talked about this. If I were to say we should take the gospel to everyone. Sunday school, right? We know that. We know, we know what's right. We know what the right answer is. It's everyone. It's just like if you're in Sunday school, just answer Jesus. You can't really have it. They can't really argue with you. <laughs> who did this? Jesus. Well, no, it was Moses. Well, who gave him the power? Yeah, right? It's always Jesus, right? We know the Sunday school answer to this. Then why isn't it happening? And I think we're going to look at something today that I think is a challenge to me personally. This is a very difficult message for me. And so I'm going to do something that's way out of character for, for me in this church. And I'm actually going to preach for the third time in this church this message. On top of that, this is not my message. I have never preached anybody else's message other than this one right here, and it's the third time. And I would almost guarantee that nobody in here remembers it. Not a knock on anybody, right? We just, life happens, so I preached this in 2020 when we first started. I preached it in 2022 as we had been in this building and kind of got into a new season. And I'm preaching it today, and I think it maybe fits today more than ever. This is a, this is a sermon by Judah Smith at Church Home. If you've ever listened to Judah Smith, I love the way he preaches, he's very loud, uh, which I really like. He uses his hands a lot, which I really like. Uh, and so I, I just fell in love with this, this message, and I just thought, I want to share this, but I cannot share better than what he has said. And so, again, I want to give him credit for this. Um, if, you, if you know Judah, uh, he lives in Seattle, and every single day during football season, or every single week during football season, he prays for the Seattle Seahawks during his opening message. I, I love it. I just, I love, he, he, he's, they're a lot like us. They don't take themselves serious. They take Jesus really serious. And so, 
I want to talk about the Good Samaritan. So if you have Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to break this down a little bit and talk a little bit more in depth about it. So it's found in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to go back and look at it. It says, uh, I'm reading NIV, which is a, like a third thing that I don't usually do. I'm always usually NLT, but I actually like the, the way NIV says this one. So anyway, uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? So he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. So stop right there. Dude got the Sunday school answer. He wanted to test Jesus and Jesus in Jesus' form, as Jesus always did, asks an even better question. How do you read it? Well, I'm a lawyer. I don't know if you know that, but I'm pretty well versed in Scripture. So let me just tell you what the answer is, Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is like, you got it, bud. Good job. It's probably going to stop there. Nope. <laughs> Do this and you'll live. But he, the lawyer, wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happening to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So, here we have this scene of, of Jesus beginning ministry. We have the religious people, the, the lawyers, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these people who really knew Scripture. They were the religious people, and they were the, the leaders. They were kind of in charge of religion. They didn't like this Jesus who was coming and saying things that, that they didn't agree with. They, they were in charge of this thing. And so these lawyers would always go up to Jesus to challenge him with these questions. And so as this guy approaches Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? He's not saying, hey, I really want to know. He's saying, I, I'm, I'm challenging you. I, I think I have it figured out. I'm the religious person. You tell me if you have it figured out. And so as Jesus answers this question, this guy still wanting to justify himself because he's better than everybody because he's a religious person. He's got it figured out. So who is my neighbor then, Jesus? I mean, it sounds good, but who exactly is my neighbor. So Jesus tells this radical story, and again, a lot of times in Scripture, we have to plant ourselves into the moment. The story that Jesus told, we're, we're used to the Good Samaritan, we have a Good Samaritan law, we have Good Samaritan charities, like, it's kind of commonplace for us. When Jesus told this story, they would have been enraged at him. See, the Samaritans were not Loved people. They were a rejected and despised race. They were half-breeds to the Jews. There's a lot of things that we think we have bad now, and, and, and we do, but there was some really, there was some class, and there was some ranking, and there were some really despised and rejected people back in that day. And you see that the man can't even say, well, it was the Samaritan. He just says, yeah, the one who showed mercy. This was not about wanting to learn from Jesus, or it was just about himself. I want to feel good about me. And Jesus is like, you got to get outside of that. We just went through a series called Countercultural, where, it's, where we learned that we have to get outside of ourselves if we want to try and find true happiness. And that was leading up to this series on purpose. We've got to get outside of ourselves if we're actually going to go and do the work of Jesus. 
Remember, that's why we're here. That's why we didn't just get whisked away into heaven when we said yes to Jesus, because we have a job to do here. What is the job? To go into the world and make disciples. So what happens a lot of time when we hear the Good Samaritan is we say, okay, you're right. I need to do better. I need to care a little bit more. I'm, I'm a little bit selfish. I, I should probably do better. I should probably try to love people better. Okay, I'll kind of strap up my boots here, and, and I'll go out and try to love some people tomorrow. You know, you know what? When some come, someone cuts me off, I, I'm not going to do anything this one time. <laughs> you know, like, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try a little bit, and then we get right back to our me-centered life. I'm saying me. I know not you. Again, I just preach this stuff to me. If it hits you too, that's on you. This is just for me and me alone. And what happens is we just kind of feel bad about ourselves. We know we should be doing these things. We should be loving other people better. We should be caring for people outside of ourselves. But we just can't seem to continue to do it. And so Jesus doesn't tell this story to make this guy feel bad. He tells the story to, to tell him, hey, maybe there's a better way than this. Maybe it's not even about you. Jesus, as he tells a story, he tells it to completely change the narrative of how we treat people in religion. He flips it completely on its head. It's this paradoxical way of living a Christ follower life. That's what we talked about in the Beatitudes. It's upside down. It's, kind of, it's weird. It's not, not, the, not the same way that other people live, and it leads us to true happiness so we see these things and we think that we should be the good samaritan we should do these things and what we like to do with the bible is we like to plant ourselves in it can i can i tell you something i had to learn the bible i'm not the hero in the bible i'm not the savior jesus is the hero and so often we want to plant ourselves into these stories and i need to do this and i need to No, this is pointing to Jesus. And I think if we would figure that out, that it's always pointing to Jesus, it would help us walk through a lot of these things. So with with that in mind, I want to look at this parable again, and I want to understand it that Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the center of this. So here we have this man, this traveler, who's been going along the way here, and he's been beaten down by these robbers. And what the lawyer doesn't understand is Jesus is saying, hey, buddy, this is you. You're the one who was traveling. You're the one who was beaten. Somewhere between the the road to Jerusalem and Jericho, which is an actual highway that Jesus would have been talking about, this man got beaten down. He's saying, that's you. So much of our life feels like we're trying to travel from here to there, trying to figure this thing out, trying to figure life out. How many of you have gotten to there only to find that there wasn't the there that you thought it would be? Only to feel like, well, I guess I need a new there. You see, this lawyer was not happy. If they truly knew Scripture, if they truly, if it wasn't about them, then when Jesus popped on the scene, they would have been like, I know Scripture well enough to know that this is the dude. This guy, the way he talks about the kingdom, the way he's the guy, but no, they're so wrapped up in their own stuff, trying to get from here to there, trying to do all the right things, trying to correct everybody who wasn't saying the things that they were saying, trying to be the religious people who controlled everything, and they're trying to get from here. And Jesus says, you're the guy on the street, beaten down. And so many of us, we walk around, and life beats us up. And says that, He was left half dead. This is such a picture of how we are as human beings. We're half dead without Jesus. That is that we are alive physically, but spiritually we are dead. There is nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to become alive again. So again, Jesus is saying, you're this guy. Recognize it. You're not better than anybody else. You are broken and beat. And again, Jesus isn't telling him this to chastise him and to be mean to him. He's trying to open his mind up to the truth of what God has for him. But he's so close-minded. He's so focused on religion. He's so focused on being right and true that he can't see the Messiah standing right in front of him. And it's easy to look at this lawyer and say, how could you? Jesus was right there. How could I? 
Jesus stands before me every single day with an opportunity and an invitation to go do kingdom work with him. And so often I reject it. Why? Because they don't deserve it. Because I want to be right. Because I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be inconvenienced. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're broken. You don't have to be the world police because you can't. You're just as broken as the next person. He's trying to get this this lawyer to release this. Can you imagine, as much as, as the Pharisees, Jesus, can you imagine the prison that they created for themselves? How miserable do you think a Pharisee was back then? That they walked around with all these 1,500 extra rules that they gave themselves that they had to keep because everybody's watching them. And then beyond that, they had to police the rest of the world on these rules. Do you think they were jolly people? (laughs) Do you think they skipped to and fro? No, they were miserable. And what they wanted to do is bring people into their misery. Misery loves company. I believe it comes from the Pharisees because they were like, we hate our life and you should too. (laughs) Like, why would I want to follow you guys? And Jesus is saying, you weren't meant to carry that burden. You're broken. You need somebody. And we've got to understand that today. We can become religious people just like that. We were the broken. We were the beat. So what happens? Jesus says, so this man is is bloody and beaten and, and half dead. And a priest comes by and he walks by on the other side. And a Levite comes by, and he walks on the other side. Now, again, for us, we don't understand the gravity of what Jesus was saying, but they would have understood that what Jesus is saying, this law that you think controls everything, it can't save you. It's got to pass by on the other side. It can show you that you're broken, but it can't save you from it. It has to pass by on the other side. It can't bring the healing and the help that you need. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And what the law did is it just showed them that they were broken. It just showed them that they had sinned. And Jesus says, hey, you're broken, and the law that you hold so dearly to, it can't save you. You're holding it so closely. It's become your God. It can't save you. You need something else. Following the rules cannot save you. It's something we still struggle with today. The rules pass by on the other side. And then along comes a Samaritan. And about this time, the arms would get crossed. How dare you even say that word around us? Do you know who we are? We've been in church for 30 years. We've been, I've been saved since I was four. How dare you say that word in front of me, Samaritan. And Jesus is like, well, let me tell you what the Samaritan did. You're going to hate this even more. <laughs> Samaritans were rejected by the Jews. Samaritans were looked down on. Jesus, we are told, was rejected by his own. This is so important to understand in this story. And this could have been a light bulb moment for this lawyer. Jesus is trying to get him to see, I'm the good Samaritan. Jesus is the good Samaritan. We were never meant to fill the role of good Samaritan. We can't be that good. Jesus is the good Samaritan. That's what changes this story. That's what he was trying to get the man to see. You need someone who can come and do this. And in our human form and in our religion, you can't. You're so clouded by yourself and all these things. You need someone who really can come and help you. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. When we understand that, when we read Scripture that way, we understand that the power to do the things that I can't do does not come for me. I'm not this, you know, just suck it up a little bit more and be a Good Samaritan. 
No, I need Jesus because I'm the broken and the beat, and the law can't save me, only Jesus can. I need the Good Samaritan to come to me, to help me, to continue to heal me, to continue to control my life. I need Jesus every day. What does it say that the, good, the, the, the Samaritan did? He gets down off of his donkey. You see the picture of Jesus coming to this earth. And he bandages the man, and then he places him on the donkey. Think about this. He who knew no sin became sin for my salvation. He switched places with me. He took my cross. And Jesus is trying to foreshadow for this lawyer, I'm going to do something that only I can do. Your law that you hold so tightly to, it can't do what I can do for you. I'm going to take your place. I'm putting you in my place on this donkey. It says that he took him to the inn. Now, what he was doing for this man was foreshadowing the gospel of what was going to happen. I'm going to lay my life down for you, and I'm going to put you in my place so that you can once again have a relationship with the Father. Now, it really should just stop there. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. That's, that's all that Jesus needed to do. He should just share the good news with this guy. But something interesting happens. We get more of the story here in verse 35. So again, Jesus shares a story about what the gospel is, and he could have stopped there. I'm the good Samaritan. I'm going to take your place, and I'm going to put you in my place. Done. Why do we have more to this story? Well, let's look at verse 35 again. It says, the next day, or I'm sorry, verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Again, we could, we could stop there even. Okay, well, he did all the work that he needed to do, and, and now he's going to move on. Verse 35, why is this in there? The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra spent you may have. Why is that in there? What does that add to the story for the lawyer? Nothing. They could have stopped with, he took care of him, he took him to the end, Jesus did his thing, we're good to go. It's almost like Jesus wanted to include something that maybe wasn't for the lawyer, but maybe years later a church would sit here and read this and wonder, why is this in here? What's this deal with the end? And it's almost like it's there because Jesus wanted to take this man. Remember, Jesus is the good Samaritan. He wanted to take him somewhere that they would care for him. He couldn't take him to his home. The home was too far away. Why didn't the good Samaritan take him to his home? The home was too far away. So he took him to a place that he could take him, an inn. It's almost like Jesus just said this part of the story so that 2,000 years later, a church would read it and understand that the inn is the church. And that Jesus has been clear on the mission of the church from the very beginning. Do you see how my voice breaks like that? That means I'm really passionate about it. I want to talk about this end. Because there's really no reason for verse 35 to be in there. Unless there's something that we can get from it. So I want to make a couple of observations and then, and then we'll be done. Because if we're going to be a church that's just Jesus, we have that written on our wall back here. We better know what Jesus expects of us as a church. If we're going to be a billboard for his name, if we're going to be like, hey, we're a church which is the bride of Christ, which is the representative of God here on this earth, we better daggum know what we're supposed to be doing. And Jesus tells us about that. So the first thing that we see about the end is the proximity to pain. It's the proximity to pain. As Jesus is talking about this inn, it's actually a new concept that was happening during this time because there were these thoroughfares like, right, like Jerusalem to Jericho that people would go. They didn't have cars, they didn't have trains, they didn't have fast ways to get there. So you travel by foot or you travel by donkey. This did not happen quickly. And so what would happen on these major thoroughfares is robbers and thieves would hang out and then when it got to nighttime or, or, or hard to see, they would jump out and they would pillage and they would rob and they would, they would beat and they would kill and all these things were happening. 
And so people got together and said, hey, let's start setting up these inns where this is happening and give people a safe place to stay. And so Jesus says, took them to the inn. These, these inns would set up their inns, not in the lush areas of Jerusalem and Jericho, but on the way where the pain was the worst, where people needed it the most. Jesus is inferring that the community of believers, the ecclesia, the church, should be in proximity to pain. We should be around pain. Now, let's be honest. We try our hardest to stay away from pain. It's kind of bred in us. We don't like pain. We don't want to touch something that's odd. That's, that's a natural reaction, but we kind of live that way. We kind of just, I don't really want to be around anything that's kind of difficult to deal with. I just, I, I want to be in my own little world here. I, I don't really want to deal with pain. But Jesus seems to say that the life of church is not about avoiding pain, but rather setting up shop and running to pain. Just the opposite of what we tend to do. No, no, no. It's not that you avoid pain. It's that I want you to go find pain. <laughs> go seek out those who are hurting. That's what I want for you. You set up shop where you can find pain the most. A life that's willing to listen to someone when they're hurting and be there when someone's in need. A life that's not repelled by others' pain, but sees pain as an opportunity to love and serve and show the goodness of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I'm sure glad that Jesus didn't walk by me. I'm glad that Jesus wasn't inconvenienced by my pain. We joke around with our kids. One of my favorite things to do is that they don't want to do something. Oh, I'm so tired, I don't want to do the dishes. So my response is always, man, I'm really glad Jesus wasn't too tired for the cross. <laughs> we call it a Jesus juke in our house. And as much as we joke around about that, there's so much truth to that. I'm glad that Jesus cared enough to leave the 99 for me. How often I forget that I was the broken, the bleeding, the half-dead man. And Jesus cared enough to come chase after me, to leave the 99, to come find me. And I'm taken back to that moment in the garden before he takes my cross, takes my nails, takes my death, and he's praying so hard that literal blood is coming out of his pores. And he says, I don't want the pain. If there's any other way to do it, let me know. I don't want the pain. Not my will, though, but yours be done. And for my sake, he endures the crucifixion of the cross. Jesus went to the pain for me. May I always be willing to do the same for other people. May I never be too busy to help, too prideful to help, too prideful to surround myself with broken and beaten people. God, ne let me never forget that I was that person. Which leads me to the second point. So there's a proximity to pain. We don't shy from pain. We go to the pain. But the good Samaritan gives the innkeeper permission to care. He says to the innkeeper, take care of him. There's permission to care. We, we, again, read verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Well, what's the deal with this guy, good Samaritan? Did he do this to himself? Take care of him. How does, how does he vote? I, I kind of need to know. Take care of him. What, what's his thoughts on love? I need to know that before. Take care of him. Did he hurt somebody? Take care of him. Does he tithe? Take care of him. We reserve the right as Jesus followers to care about everybody. Everybody. Permission granted. The Good Samaritan has given us permission to care for everybody. Here's what happened. And again, this is, I'm pointing my fingers at me. 
what happened is, as Christ followers, we're so worried about condoning things, we're so worried about being associated with things, that we have forfeited our permission to care. I don't, wanna, I don't want people to think I'm okay with. I, I don't know, what will they think if I do this? Or how are they going to know if I don't yell it at them? No, just permission to care. That's the only thing that I can see from this scripture right here. But what if people think, what do they think about Jesus? <laughs> he dines with sinners. I can't believe that he would. Do you think Jesus cared what they tweeted about him back then? Or X'd about him or whatever the thing is right now? Like, do you think he was reading posts like, oh, Joe from this area is upset that I'm hanging out with this guy. I better stop. What will they think? We forfeited our permission to care. And, and let, me, let me be perfectly clear with you. We, we have began to draw lines in the sand about who does and who does not deserve God's grace. And I'm telling you right now, please understand my heart. I preach this and I believe it with all my heart. I am so internally judgmental with people, it's not even funny. I don't want to be, I don't, I, I have an expectation on my life, and it's so easy for me to take that expectation and place it on everyone else's life. You should look like this, you should do this. You know who did that? The lawyer, we just read it, the Pharisees, that's what they did. I do the same thing. I just have permission to care. I hope that as a church, we get to a point where people are like, you better watch out with Simple Church. They're okay with anything. Could you know who they're letting this go on? I hope we get there. That means they're saying about us what they said about Jesus. Well, that means you condone. I didn't say we condone anything. We believe in the truth of Scripture. Did I say we condone it because we love people, we care about them? No. Stop drawing lines. Why do we have to draw lines around people? Three of you, I appreciate you. <laughs> Three of you agree with me. Here's the truth. We're going to lose some people from this church, I promise you. You start getting bloody. You start allowing people in. You start giving permission to care to everybody that, who doesn't look, think, act, and believe like you. People will leave this church. Bye, Felicia. You know what I'm saying? Like, good on you. Go find a church where you can sit and get a good pep talk and then go out and hate people. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Oops. That doesn't happen, but, this, you know, listen. Let me ask you a question. Hmm. I'm, I'm telling you right now, God's working on my heart. This is not about being mad at you guys. I have things in my life that I need to fix. If you had someone who was a loved one, kid, spouse, and they were laying on the ground dying, would you run over to them and say, how are you going to vote this November? Did you, did you do this? Did you do this to yourself? If it was my family, if this is someone I loved, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to help them. I'm going to do everything I can to help them. Why? Would I treat any of God's children any different than that? Why do I do that? I don't want to. When we have a proximity to pain and when we give permission to care, it's going to get messy. People will talk about your church. People will say all kinds of things. I am not responsible for your feelings. <laughs> The church is not responsible for your feelings. We are not responsible to make you comfortable. I would suggest just the opposite. We should be making each other uncomfortable. We should be challenging each other. Iron sharpens iron. We're refining each other. Why? Because we're responsible to answer to the Good Samaritan when he returns. See what he said there? When I come back, I'll repay you for the way you took care of him. Every one of them. Every one of them. I will pay you for that. 
Let me ask you a tough question that I've had to ask myself this week. Who have you excused yourself from caring about? Well, I don't care. I don't have to care about them because they believe and they're so in my face about it. So I don't, no, they forfeited their right for Jesus. Really? It's amazing, again, for me, the lines that I can draw. I love people. And, and I want the best for, I promise you I do. But I've got some lines in my heart that I can draw pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> Maybe some people in your life that you've allowed to draw a line around, whether they deserve Jesus or not. We rank sin and struggles with people, right? We're good at that. Just because they deal with stuff that I don't deal with, let's pry into my, let's pry into my world. <laughs> Who wants to open up that can? Who wants to pass a mic around? Let's talk about the things that we struggle with, right? And we know. We've been in church for 40 years. I, do you get this right every day? <laughs> but we expect people who don't even know this to be that. It's crazy to me. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Again, this may just be for me, but forgive me. We do it because it makes us feel better. We do it because it makes us feel better. Listen, maybe you grew up in a church that taught you to feel certain ways about certain people. Maybe it's a parent who, who introduced you to, to hating people because of the color of their skin or the way that they love or whatever the thing may be. That's why we need the Good Samaritan. That's why we're not the Good Samaritan. We need him to change our mind. We are all God's kids. Imagine if you came up to me. Here, I'll wrap up here pretty quick. Imagine if you came up to me and was like, hey, Pastor Jay, I, I love you. I love what your, your messages and stuff. Uh, I love how I'm complimenting myself in this example. But anyway, you come up and you're like, hey, I love your family, dude. Your, your wife is amazing. She's awesome. Emma, she's, she's a great volleyball player. She's fantastic. You know, she's, she's going to do great things. But your son? <laughs> Kid's a punk, dude. Do you think I would be like, nah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I love my daughter, but no. No, I'm going to introduce your face to my fist, right? Like, you're going to talk about my kid that way? I love that dude. Are you kidding me? Why? Why are we willing to do that about God's kids? Why? Because they don't think like us? Because they don't act like us? Because they don't have the truth like us? We're better than them? No, it's God's kid, man. And if we're going to be like God, if we're going to be his representative, we better care about what God cares about. Let me tell you how much God cares. He's willing to leave 99 stuck-up religious people to go find one dirty person in the ground, in the pit, in the mud, bloody, and he'll turn his back on us so quick to do that, it's not even funny. He will leave the 99 to go find that one. That's the heart of Jesus. That should be the heart of church. Our job why you're here at Simple Church is to exist, to change the world's narrative of God by becoming more like Jesus every day. Jesus went after the one. That picture you see out in our lobby is the picture of what we're meant to be as a church. We're chasing after the one. We're leaving the 99 to go find that one dirty, broken sheep that's gone astray, that needs a shepherd. And I'm not that shepherd. Jesus is. It's time to erase the lines, church. There are no lines around who does and who does not get to be saved. We're not better than anybody else. We've just got to experience the grace and forgiveness of Jesus. He says, take care of them. I'll repay you for everything that you do. You want to find real joy in life? I'll give you that. Go love people. Permission to care. Forget about all these lines. Forget about... Stop being angry. Last thing, last thing, and I promise I'll wrap up here. It says that Jesus brought him to the end. Go back to verse 34 if you don't mind, Colby. I want, I want, to, I want us to look at this. I think this will, this, will, this will get it all here. He went to him and bandaged his wounds. Jesus did this, not us, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey. Jesus did, not us. Brought him to the end. Jesus did, not us. People, Jesus brings people to church. He does the work. He, he works on their heart. Took him to the end and 
Read this last part with you. And took care of him. Who did? So you're telling me that Jesus took him to the church and, and took care of him. I thought it was the job of the righteous people in the church to tell them what they're doing wrong. It looks to me like Jesus wants to bring him to church. He wants to take care of him. And all he says to the church is, look after him. Love him. They don't know what they're doing. They're broken. Stop judging them. Stop hating them. I'll take care of that. I took care of you. You don't have the strength to do it. You don't have, you don't know how to help them. Just look after them. That's the help that you can give. I'll change them. We have, I'm sorry. Forgive me for yelling. That's going to peak if you're listening to this on Spotify or whatever. This, I'm telling you, I'm preaching this because I am so tired of me feeling this way. I'm so tired of getting on Facebook, and yes, I don't ever externally say anything. I hold it all in, but I judge people so harshly. I'm tired of it. I don't want to do that anymore. It consumes my life sometimes. Why don't I just stop and pray for that person? What does me hating on them or wanting to, man, if I could just tell them the truth right now, what it does no good? Look after him. That's Jesus' words. Father, release us to just care for people. Goodness, can we just let go of this? Who do we share the good news of Jesus with every single last person we come in contact with? Last thing I'll say, I promise. I know I've said that four times. The woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus. And all the people were there. And Jesus said, okay. You religious people, whichever one you, of you has this perfect, you, go ahead, stone her. That's great. You're right, you caught her in sin. Go, stone her. One by one they go away because they know that they, they, they're not good enough. And Jesus with this woman says, there's no one here to, to convict you. Neither do I. What does he tell her in that moment? Now go and sin no more. Jesus could have told her in front of everybody that was there, hey, before you guys go, let me just be really clear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the truth with her. I want everybody to hear this. Go and sin no more. Did everybody hear that? Jesus waited until they were all gone, and he was one-on-one -on -one with this lady. Then he shared the truth with her. Jesus would have never shared the truth on Facebook. Hear me. He would have never shared the truth on Facebook. You want to know what truth he would have shared? You religious people, stop being stupid. You freaking hypocrites. Now, he would have said that. I'm sorry. That's just the anger in me that's about me coming out. He wouldn't have said that. That's what he would have posted. He never would have ranted on any social platform. He would have gone to the person and said, hey, i got a better way for you. I love you. And even to this lawyer who was asking this question for selfish reasons, Jesus was offering salvation and hope and joy. That's our job. We're the end. We're called to care for people. I hope that you feel as passionate about this as I do. This is where we're headed. We're going to be a place that we can, Jesus can bring people and we can just look after them. Jesus will do the change and he'll do what he needs to do. He'll, he'll fix what needs to be fixed and that's his job. We're here to care for him. Permission to care. Can we take that on together? That's my prayer for us today. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.